No nail brighter this week. Ball State rolls over Central Michigan on the road. We'll take a look back at the win, update you on some meaningful injuries moving forward, and bowl eligibility on the line this weekend as Ball State takes on the Army Black Knights. Third down chirp starts right now. Ball State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit PapaJohns.com today for more info. Hello and welcome in this week's episode of Third Down Chirp for the 2012 season. I'm your host, Chris Rankle. Joined as always, Timmy Fogarty and Pat Boylan. And after a couple weeks of some nail biting wins down to the wire, we finally got a little bit of a break and it feels I'm very relieved. Yeah, first comfortable win on the road in the Pete Lembo era and we don't have to bite our nails because this week guys, we're in the studio <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, lightning can't hit us here. I, I totally agree with you there and guys, for the first time all season, we saw Ball State pretty much put together 60 minutes of good football and it was a great sight to see. Let's take a look back at that win and at the highlights as Ball State went into Mount Pleasant to take on the Central Michigan Chippewas, a very meaningful road game for Ball State as they're trying to get back to five wins. And early on, Ball State offense rolling. Barrington Scott takes it in from six yards out. He would have a phenomenal game, 99 yards rushing. Ball State up 7 nothing. Ryan Radcliffe trying to find his receiver, tipped around, picked off by Quentin Cooper. Cooper in the right place at the right time. The Central Michigan receiver bats it right at him. He makes the diving catch. The Ball State defense would be phenomenal, but it here it's Ryan Radcliffe. He's going to find Ben McCord for a touchdown. Ben McCord originally committed to Ball State, decommitted, and is now a Chippewa. Would have been nice to see him in those Cardinal jerseys. Game all timed at 7 until Ball State starts rolling right before the half. Uh, Willie Sneed finds the end zone. The Cardinals would take a 24-10 lead into the half. And in the second half, more of the same. This time, Keith Wenning finding Zane Fakes. And how about the development of Zane Fakes, a guy who's really stepped up his game this year, and now he is heavily utilized in the passing game. Radcliffe trying to bring his team back. He's going to be greeted by Mr. Newman, Brandon Newman with the sack fumble. Nathan Ollie scoops, and he almost scores just a, a few steps too slow. The big man almost sees his dream come true, but tripped up at the last second. Keith Winning's going to find Barrington Scott through the air this time. Wide open, tip those in for the touchdown. The Scott was so wide open, and Winning threw it so hard in there, he scared me at first, but... As the usual with Keith Wenning, his throw right on the money. Zerlon Tipton would make this one pretty close as he runs it in in the fourth quarter for the touchdown. The chips are within striking distance, but really no doubt in this one as Steven Schott's going to put a kick through the uprights and uh, give Ball State the lead. And that's the nail in the coffin right there. Huge road win for the Cardinals. 41 to 30 the final, a relaxing win from Ball State in the Pete Lembo era. And they now get to five wins. We take a look at the stats and scores of the 41 to 30 win over uh, Central Michigan. Keith Wenning, another solid game, 231 yards and three touchdowns. And you know, he didn't light up the, the, uh, the stats by any means, 231 yards, but he doesn't always need to. A good game from Keith, played very well, played within himself, and uh, was a big reason the Cardinals won so comfortably. Well, guys, and winning had one interception on the day, but in his defense, he was blindsided while he was throwing. The ball kind of floated up in the air. So that was the only flaw he really had Saturday. Just a tremendous day for Keith Winning. And what, a lot of guys really played well. Another one we didn't mention was Barrington Scott getting the start, 99 yards rushing and a touchdown. But you have to give player of the game honors. We ask you every week, who do you give it to? For me, it's going to be Keith Wenning. And, and you know, if, if you look at his stats, if you just looked at the box score of this game, you would look at it and you, and you would say, well, Ryan Radcliffe played the better game of the two. But Keith Wenning, what he did is he passed the eye test, and he made plays when they needed to be played, I'm, when they need to be made. I mean, Ryan Radcliffe had 108 more yards than Wenning, but Keith 
three touchdowns. The only pick he threw was really not his fault. So uh, Keith Winning, again, he doesn't always have to light up that stat book to have a good game. Yeah, Winning Pat had a great game, but I'm going to go with a guy who really kind of flew under the radar. He came out, this is kind of his coming out party, Barrington Scott, with the situation that he was put into. I mean, you have Horatio Banks, who didn't play at all because of an injury, and then Barrington Scott comes in, he gets two touchdowns, one of them through the air, one of them on the ground, and 99 yards on the ground, and he pretty much ran just so tough and so hard all game long. So I say with the situation he was put into, I think Barrington Scott was my player of the game, and he was tremendous. And a great win for the Cardinals on the road, as we said, brings them one win closer to bowl eligibility. After the game, here's a happy Coach Lembo on the win. Team, good program, Central Michigan, and uh, it was important to get off to a good start and get that first touchdown. Our defense really did a nice job getting some stops in the first half. We had a couple turnovers and uh, put them in bad position a couple times. So it was neat to see them step up and uh, help us out there and get off the field a few times. A good start to the second half. Nice balance between the run and the pass on offense. And uh, would have liked to maybe finished a little bit better than we did, but it was there was one really, really important stop where uh, with about seven minutes left, J.C. Wade got a pass break up and forced them to punt it back right there, and and that was uh, that was huge. And then the last field goal was huge because it put us up uh, by 18, which would have meant two touchdowns, two two points, and uh, we're still in good shape. So, pretty solid day, pretty solid day. You know, there were a couple hiccups here and there, uh, a couple smaller breakdowns. But overall, pretty solid day uh, to come up here and get a good road win. The season's winding down only about four weeks left for most uh, teams. So MAC play becomes increasingly important for those teams just on the cups. Uh, maybe still have hopes of a MAC uh, championship run as we take a look around the MAC presented by Fox College Sports. And how about this? Eastern Michigan coming up with their first win of the season over an Army team that Ball State's going to see this weekend, 38, 48 to 38. Yeah, Ball State's played both these teams. You have to be encouraged if you're the Cardinals because you beat Eastern Michigan handily and they had their way with Army. And then Toledo, the MAC carnage even uh, carries on a few weeks after uh, the, the big day that the MAC had. 29 23, Toledo beat the number 21 team in the nation, Cincinnati. Anytime a MAC school can beat a top 25 ranked team, and especially a team in its own state in Cincinnati, huge win for the Rockets. As we take a look at the updated uh, standings of the Mid-American Conference, and already four bowl eligible teams with Bowling Green and Ball State still one win away from bowl eligibility. And Chris, when you look at the flip side of that, you look at the East, Bowling Green, a team also five and three, Cardinal fans are rooting for them to lose the rest of the way. The Cardinals want to be that fifth bowl eligible team if they can get there. And as we take a look at Ball State's remaining schedule, remember they need six wins to be bowl eligible. You'd like to see them get seven. But the big thing, three of the last four games in Army, Toledo, and Miami, Ohio, all on the road. And the one that is at home is against a ranked Ohio team who's yet to lose this year. So there's no easy games. But you'd like to think Army and Miami are very winnable. And maybe you could even get one of the other two in the middle. I agree with you, Pat. I think Army's a very winnable game on the road. Miami's a very winnable game. And you have an Ohio team who, quite frankly, I think is a little overrated. You know, they beat they beat Akron and Buffalo and UMass, three of the so-called the three worst teams in the MAC, and they barely beat them. Kind of came down to the fourth quarter at the end of it. So I think three of those four games are very winnable games. And I think Ball State, if they play the way that they've played the last couple weeks, their defense and offense, and they can get 60 minutes of football, I really think they can beat Toledo at Toledo. Now that Ohio game is going to be a big game senior night for Ball State, and they're bringing out a little bit of a new wrinkle. It's going to be all black jerseys, uh, the first time at least that I know of that Ball State has gone with the alternative blacks. Now, while the uniforms are going to be unorthodox, there's going to be one game day tradition that is the same. Uh, Zach Hughes, Josh Blessing, and I give you a look at a tradition for Ball State game day that's unlike any other. It has become a symbol of Ball State game day. Perched along the side of the Cardinal Walk, a place of food, fans, and football. In 12 seasons, the sled hasn't missed a single home football game. You know, we tailgate, and it's a great place to congregate for the game. But to us, it's all about Ball State and about Ball State football. I mean, you'll never see us at the sled once the game starts. We've got people from we got we got little kids. We've got we've got young people. We got old people. It's a friendly spot. That's kind of the tailgating community. Everybody's kind of kind of pals when you're tailgating. Well, it's fun. Well, my husband and I both we met here at Ball State in the '70s, and we remember you know before the alumni center was here, RVs used to park up by the 
stadium. And we would walk by, you know, as kids, and he said, then he goes, someday I'd like to have an RV. So we found this old RV that was uh, mauve and blue from the, it's an 89. And I have friends from in Ohio who came up with the design for this. So they did the paint job on the outside, and then they also redid the inside for us too. But what's funny is the first game when we brought it here, truly, Ed and I sat in it by ourselves. And I looked at him and said, did we make a mistake by doing this? And he goes, I don't care. I love Ball State, and we're, you know, we're here. And it's just kind of grown, and it's, it's a conversation piece, and we've met wonderful people as a result of this. Where you find Ball State football being played, usually the sled is not far away, not only during home games, but on the road as well. We've never had an issue anywhere. We've taken it, oh gosh, we've been to nearly every MAC school. We've been to Illinois, Purdue, Indiana, out of conference. We've been to a number of places. And, and again, everyone's very friendly. They want to come in, they want to see it. They're, they think it's neat. I, I suppose the funniest thing about the RV is when, when we're coming to a game, whether it's here or away, when we're on the highway, um, you see people you know, coming up by us and they're looking, and they're looking like, oh my gosh. But as soon as they pull up next to Ed driving, they look straight ahead. It's like we're invisible to them. If we're local, you get a lot of Ball State people, you get honks, thumbs up, but if we're traveling far distances, you get a lot of gawkers. When Ed goes to get gas, you know, to gas it up before a game, people will actually say, are you a Ball State fan? What, what, what do you think, they rented this thing, you know? We've been fortunate enough to park along Cardinal Walk, and you know, for the players and a lot of people, their window, their frame of reference, um, the sled's always been here. So I don't know what the sled means to Ball State, but Ball State means everything to us. We've said it's like the box will rot off before the mechanicals go. When the box rots off, I guess we're done. <laughs> but until that day, you can expect if it's game day in Muncie, the sled will be there. For Ball State Sports Link, I'm Chris Rankle. And this weekend, a big road game again as Ball State heads to West Point to take on the men who will someday lead the United States Army into combat in the Army Black Knights. And one of the key players on the Ball State defense who's going to be in charge of stopping that Army triple option offense is linebacker Kenny Lee. Pat Boylan and Palmer Durr give us a closer look at the junior outside linebacker. Kenneth Lee, uh, linebacker. My father played ball. Uh, I played at Kentucky State and Indiana State, and uh, my uncles and all my other cousins always played, so I think that's easy. I went there uh, with Coach under Coach Esposito, and uh, by my sophomore year, by the end of my sophomore year, I was on my third head coach. And um, I'm not one for switching up coaches every year, I, I didn't like that. And so I, I figured I could play at the next level. I should have played at the next level out of high school, I just didn't have it great. And so I worked my butt off in the classroom. Uh, Got my, got my release forms and, and look D1. Criminal justice is my major. And as far as like the workload with, in that field is not that much, it's just a lot of papers and reading. It's not as much as projects and you know stuff like that. So it, the workload's not that bad, so it bounces out pretty well. I've always been interested in being a U.S. Marshal. And so uh, a U.S. Air Marshal, and I, I got uncle, an uncle in the U.S. Marshal and an uncle in the U.S. Air Marshal, so I could, I could find a way into that, I believe. I'm a big fisher, and uh, if I'm not fishing or playing football or clash or something like that, I'm playing video games. I'm never one to click up with people. I'm usually good with everybody. Like, you'll see me talking to Kid O'Brien, you'll see me talking to Avery Bailey, hang out with Jonathan Newsom, hang out with um, Kelly on some weekends, you know what I mean? It's, I'm all over the place. The only real superstition I have is uh, if it's raining, I can't wear gloves. And every game day, I have to eat a box of Mike and Ike's pregame. When I was a kid, even before uh, Little League games, I never ate breakfast. It was always like, Mama, let me get some Skittles. Can I get a, can I get a fan? Let me get a, something, you know what I mean? So, and Mike and Ike's my favorite candy, so that's what it is. I'm not one for individual goals, really. But uh, if they come, they come. But uh, I really want a MAC championship. Never had a ring. Uh, never had a state medal. Never had, you know what I mean? So I want some hardware for myself. And this weekend, again, a very big game for Ball State, trying to get back to six wins for the second straight year 
as we break down these two teams in our head-to-head -head segment, starting with the quarterbacks and an interesting matchup quarterbacks wise. You know, Keith Wenning obviously owns the passing statistics, but Trent Steelman, he's really more of a runner and he's a phenomenal runner at that. Yeah, you can't really compare these guys very much. I mean, they're two completely different animals. I mean, look at the passing yards for Trent Steelman. Wenning had more in the Kent State game by himself in that one game than Steelman has all year. Steelman, obviously the runner. It's a completely different offense. Wenning the thrower, pretty tough to compare. Yeah, as far as quarterback statistics go, guys, you can't compare the two at all. But Steelman has two things. He's a great leader, and he knows how to run this offense. And when you have a guy like that running your triple offense, it makes things so much easier. And at the running back position, uh, Raymond Maple is the leading rusher for the Black Knights, but they have four or five, maybe even six running backs who, who carry the load with him. You're right, and it's tough to, you know, kind of pinpoint one guy. Maples is going to get a lot of carries, but there are a lot of guys that are going to get a lot of carries. That's just how the Army offense works. Maples is a big play guy, though. You look at those six yards per attempt, that's not really a consistent six. It's a one, a two, a three, and then a 50-yard run. Jawan, on the other hand, he's much more the consistent four to eight yards per carry guy. So while the stats look the same, not the same player. Yeah, Maples, 112 yards a game on the season, but a stat that really caught my eye, only one touchdown so far. At the wide receiver spot, Willie Sneed closing in on a 1,000-yard receiving year and still only a sophomore. Yeah, he had last week six catches for 52 yards and a touchdown, and everyone was saying, where was Willie Sneed? That just shows how big he's been this year and how good he's been, that when he has 52 yards and a touchdown, people are saying, what, was, what happened? Was that an off game? Yeah, that, that's extremely comical just because he still had his touchdown like he's all, you see that he's like always getting every week. But the two most important stats, guys, he leads the MAC in receptions and in yards. And on defense, a real big factor for Ball State as the Army, uh, Army offense puts up major rushing yards. But Ball State, luckily, they've been better uh, versus the run than versus the pass. And when you look at that Army defense, the big number that jumps out against for me is that 51.1% opponent third down percentage. That's also a stat that the Cardinals offensively are very good at. Really no doubt in my mind the Cardinals are going to move the ball this weekend. Guys, the first four weeks of the season, third downs really just plagued the Cardinals. They've really struggled. Going back to the Northern Illinois game, though, they the defense uh, has stopped them on 26 of 31 third down attempts. So opponents are only getting five of the last 31 on third down. So a terrific stat from this defense. And building off of the Ball State defense, of course, the biggest thing is they have to stop the triple option, something that all the academies run very well, though they run different variations of it. But the Army triple option, a lot of running, very tough to defend. There are just so many ways that they can throw uh, yards and different plays at, at Ball State. And it's really going to be interesting to see how uh, Coach Bateman is able to formulate a game plan for this. And part of what makes that so hard, Chris, you were just talking about it, is is doing that game plan when Army runs this every single week. And if you're Ball State, you only get this week to prepare for it. Now, Coach Lembo talked about it earlier this week. He said, ideally, you'd like to play these guys early in the season because then you can devote some of your time over the summer into working on this defense. That's what the Cardinals did last year before the Army game. But in this situation with the game so late in the schedule, you can't really prepare over the summer for a game that you're having in week nine. So if you're Ball State, it's, it's definitely a tougher challenge this week than they had in the past year playing Army. Yeah, the triple option gives defensive coaches nightmares in college football. It's just so tough to defend. But there are two things that you have to have and have to be able to do to successfully stop the triple option. The first and most important thing is you have to get defensive interior pressure. That means your two defensive linemen, you have Brandon Newman and Nathan Ollie, they have to be able to just go at the guards and those centers and really get a push. And the other thing, have an athletic defensive end. And they have exactly that in Jonathan Newsom. And when Ball State travels to West Point, they will be without two key players of their offense as we give you an updated look at the injury report, starting with center Dan Manick went down with an ankle injury in Central Michigan. Luckily, it's just a sprained ankle. It looked a lot worse than that. It did. It looked really bad. Whenever you have a guy going off on a cart, you usually assume the worst about 95% of the time. It probably is the worst. But in this case, Dan Manick, he's out this week, questionable next week, should be good for Ohio. As far as I'm concerned, that's a major victory if you're Ball State because this is a guy that you can't really afford to lose for many more games than they've already lost him. And at the running back position, Horatio Banks continues to be a little banged up. He's uh, questionable with the knee. However, Coach Lembo said he will make the trip, but he's not listed on the depth chart, so really not looking good for Horatio Banks. Yeah, it's tough to still not have Horatio Banks after what you saw he could do when they played Clemson, how successful he was. But last week was, you know, kind of just a sigh of relief for Coach Lustig and the rest of those coaches. Barrington Scott fills in that role, does a great job, gets two touchdowns. So losing Horatio Banks is tough, but they have guys step into that role. 
Now, we're not going to be able to watch those two guys on the field, but Pat, who should we be watching this week as Ball State takes on Army? For me, it's Willie Sneed. Do you remember the game this kid had last year? It was really his coming out party as a freshman, and uh, Willie had 10 catches, 180 yards, and, uh, and a touchdown against Army. And really, uh, like I said, it was his coming out party when people really realized what exactly this kid could do. You see right there, catch on the sideline. I mean, he had a great game against Army last year, so I look for him to have an even bigger game. They know the ball's going to him, and at least Last year, they couldn't stop him, and we know he's been better. I'm going to go on the defensive side of the ball, guys. I'm going to go with Travis Freeman. I mean, Freeman against this triple option offense can do a great job of filling in the gaps. When those two D tackles are taken out of the play, Freeman can step up, fill that gap, and make a play. And Travis Freeman last week set the NCAA record for career-assisted tackles. So that is just an incredible stat. He has 83 tackles just on the season alone. So just to you know, have a guy like that on your defense, that just makes things so much easier for Coach Bateman. And also a great guy off the field oh, as yeah. well and a phenomenal defensive mm -hmm. leader overall. We're sure going to miss him when he leaves uh, after this season. Now on the opposite side of that, Players to Improve continues to be a tough segment, I know, for you guys because all <laughs> State's playing so well right now. It's hard to pick one person to improve. This gets harder and harder each week to pick, especially when you have a dominating victory against Central Michigan. You kind of got to be picky, and that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to be picky, and that's with Austin Holtz, and he's maybe – arguably the best offensive lineman that the Cardinal has. He's that bookend left tackle that you love to have, but there was one play against Central Michigan where he failed to pick up a blitzing linebacker, and that guy came in and, uh, and, and leveled Keith, and that actually turned into an interception. Now, when you have a blowout game like you did against uh, Central Michigan, that play didn't wasn't that big. This is it right here. You're watching it. That play was not that big, but in the grand scheme of things, if he allows something like that to happen again in a closer game, it'll be a lot more important stuff they have to get figured out. Guys, I don't really have a player to improve. It's kind of another player to watch, and mine's going to be Jonathan Newsom because when you run the option offense, your quarterback makes all the plays and he makes the reads, and the person he's reading off of is the last guy on the line of scrimmage, which will be Jonathan Newsom in this case at defensive end. And if, the, if Newsom keeps his shoulders squared with the line of scrimmage, they'll hand it off to the fullback. If he comes down the line and goes for the fullback, they'll run that option. But having an athletic defensive end like Jonathan Newsom, who's as quick enough to get around that corner, if he has his shoulder squared and they give it to the fullback, he still has time to make a play. And finally, Ball State trying to get back to six wins for the second year in a row, get back to bowl eligibility, and actually be able to go to a bowl game this year. A win this weekend would be huge. What are going to be the keys to a Cardinal victory? For me, it's defensive integrity, and I'm going to kind of piggyback on what Timmy's been talking about here the last couple minutes. When you play a triple option offense, it's extremely important that you do what you can do and you stay in your gap and don't try to do too much. For example, Timmy was talking about Travis Freeman a moment ago, that the way that triple option works is almost every time – they, they give a fake or a handoff to the fullback up the middle. If Travis Freeman is not there and he starts to cheat on the option when it goes to either side, they're going to get beat up the middle. It's very important. Guys do what they can do, stay in their lane, fill their gaps, and if they do that, they'll be just fine. They did it last year, and they were just fine last year. Well, discipline's huge with, you know, with that offense, but mine's going to be productive drives. And what I mean by that is, Army runs the ball so much that they could have a 15 play, you know, eight minute drive and take half of the quarter clock on. So they need to have productive drives and score points whenever they get the football. And finally, it's time for our What's Tripping Question of the Week. Remember, you can tweet a question at Third Down Chirp or hashtag Tweet Peak. And if we pick your question and answer it on air, you win a free pizza from Papa John's. Our question this week comes from at Sean O. McNally, who asks, what will it take for the Ball State football team to take the next step as a program? And I think he means uh, competing for MAC championships every year. Right. Well, it kind of does depend on what he means, Chris, is that's very open uh, to interpretation. In my opinion, Ball State football has taken a step from last year to this year. You've seen a more complete football team, a team that plays closer to 60-minute football just about every week than you saw last year. But in terms of that next step, competing for a MAC championship, getting eight, nine wins, it's just going to take it's going to take more time under Lembo's system. He's got to get more guys in there. You see how much deeper they are this year than last year. They'll be even more deep next year than they are this year. And you look at Northern Illinois, a team who's, you know, the, the team you try to be like mm -hmm. in the MAC. they're very deep. That's something the Cardinals are trying to emulate. Well, and I agree with you, Pat. I think they kind of have taken that ne next step. And, I mean, this season they beat two BCS teams in South Florida and IU. So that is huge as far as recruiting goes and just confidence in your team goes. And as far as MAC championships and everything, they are all starting to finally buy into Coach Limbo's system. And I think it, it'll take about another year or two years till all the pieces are working together in the puzzle. Thank you for your question. At Sean O. McNally, you've won a free pizza courtesy of Papa John's. Of course, if your question didn't get picked this week, you always got next week. Tweet at Third Don Chirp or hashtag Tweet Pete. 
for a chance to win. And for the latest in Ball State stories and news, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Just search Ball State Sports Link. All right, time for predictions. Pat, you got a crucial victory last week. Timmy's still got a sizable lead, though, so pressure's on again. Who you got? Pull myself back in here in this one. I'm going to take Ball State 34-24, to a 10-point win over Army. I think the defense plays well. Cardinals get the win. I'm going to go with Ball State 35, Army 17. Last year it was a blowout. I'm starting to have confidence in this Ball State offense that they can score points, so I think this will be a big victory for them. It should be a great game. Ball State trying to get back to six wins for the second year in a row. Kickoff at noon in West Point. You can listen to three of us on Sportslink Radio, 91.3 WCRD. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Third Down Chirp. Remember to watch us on Fox College Sports nationally, Comcast Indiana across the state, and locally in Muncie on WIPB-TV. So, for all of us here at Sportsling, next week, uh, let's hope we're talking about bowl hopes as the season wraps up and hopefully Ball State gets a big win. So, for all of us at Sportsling and for Timmy Fogarty and Pat Boylan, I'm Chris Rankle. Until next week, go Cardinals.